Get ready, because I'm in a bad versus good mood, and today we're gonna talk about monologues. By the way, my name is Brandon McNulty, and I'm releasing a new book at the end of the month. It's called The Half Murders, and I've been pitching it as Jekyll and Hyde meets The Haunting of Hill House. If this sounds like something you're into, check out the pre-order link in the description below. When we talk about monologues, we're talking about a speech given by a single character. It's spoken to at least one other character, and it might occur within a conversation, or it might be its own standalone thing. Today we're going to look at what separates bad monologues from good ones. We'll discuss what good monologues do, then we'll look at four types of bad monologues, and for each type I'll give you a bad example from a story, and I'll explain why it sucks, then I'll give you a good example and explain why that one works. Here's your spoiler warning for today, the ones in red contain the heaviest spoilers. Also, since a lot of these monologues last several minutes, I'll be trimming them down for pacing purposes. If you want to watch the complete versions, I'll I'll link to them in the description below. Now let's kick things off by answering the question, what do good monologues do? I came up with five particular things. The first one is that they serve a story purpose. This means that a monologue will share thoughts, sway emotions, reveal motivations, and inspire action. Second thing good monologues do, they engage the story's theme. They express the story's core idea, or they tackle a major question at the heart of the story. Obviously, you don't want to get preachy here, but hitting on the story's theme can add impact to a speech. Third thing they do, they create an appropriate response in the listener. Remember, even though only one person is doing the speaking, whoever's listening should react in a believable way. Number four, they sound natural, especially in regards to character and situation. With character, think about the speaker, who they are, and how they use words to accomplish their goals. For instance, in Game of Thrones, Tyrion and Daenerys both give speeches, but their personalities and backgrounds will affect things like their word choice, sentence structure and tone. As for situation, think about the difference between speaking to a close friend versus speaking to a bunch of strangers, or speaking on a battlefield versus speaking inside a courtroom. Finally, the fifth thing that good monologues do, they use poetic techniques. Now let me be clear, this doesn't mean you have to include flowery language or rhyme patterns. Instead, try repeating certain words for effect, try working in metaphors, or try arranging sentences in clever ways. If you want to learn more about spicing up your sentences, I'd recommend checking out out the book The Elements of Eloquence by Mark Forsyth. This book covers more than 40 different techniques, it'll give your writing a boost, and if you are interested, I'll link to it in the description below. Now let's look at an example that incorporates these five things that good monologues do. I'm going to show a clip from the movie Good Will Hunting. In this scene, Robin Williams plays a therapist named Sean who is trying to convince his patient, Will, to take therapy seriously. Keep in mind that Will is a genius who absorbs tons of information from books, but he lacks real life experience. If I ask you about women, you probably give me a silver, say your personal favorites. You may have even been laid a few times, but you can't tell me what it feels like to wake up next to a woman and feel truly happy. When I ask you about war, you probably uh, throw Shakespeare at me, right? Once more into the breach, dear friends, but you've never been near one. You've never held your best friend's head in your lap and watch him gasp his last breath looking to you for help. I ask you about love, you probably quote me a sonnet, but you've never looked at a woman and been totally vulnerable. And you would know about sleeping, sitting up in a hospital room for two months, holding her hand, because the doctors could see in your eyes that the terms visiting hours don't apply to you. You don't know about real loss, because that only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. I doubt you've ever dared to love anybody that much. You're an orphan, right? Do you think I know the first thing about how hard your life has been, how you feel, who you are, because I read all of the twist? This works first of all because it serves a purpose. We have a psychologist trying to get through to a young man who has a strong fear of abandonment. The speech is somber and heartfelt and it challenges will to change. It also engages the story's theme, which is knowledge versus wisdom. The speech expresses Sean's painful first-hand experiences, and it contrasts those with what Will has learned from books. Another thing the speech does, it creates an appropriate listener response. Will falls silent after Sean hits him with an overwhelming amount of truth and wisdom. And the monologue sounds natural coming from an emotionally intelligent man like Sean. And it fits the situation where Sean is making a sincere effort to connect with Will. Finally, this speech is low 
loaded with poetic techniques and language. We get vivid images, repetition of certain phrases, and piercing lines like how real loss only occurs when you love someone more than you love yourself. All right, now let's do some bad versus good. As I mentioned, I'm gonna give you four types of bad monologues. I'll explain what each one is, then I'll give you a bad example to illustrate what I mean, and then I'll give you a good example that does the job better. First type of bad monologue is the absurd audience reaction. This is when a listener's reaction to a speech doesn't ring true, and it destroys the story's credibility by creating a ridiculous, laughable, or unbelievable outcome. And it's a case where writers are forcing an outcome for the sake of the plot or the story's themes. For a bad example, let's look at Rocky IV. This is the one that's set during the Cold War, and basically Rocky's best friend gets obliterated by a Russian boxer, and then Rocky has to fly across the globe to settle the score. Then, once Rocky wins an epic 15-round fight, he gets interviewed in front of the Russian crowd, which includes countless citizens, as well as several of the country's leaders. Pay attention to how these people respond to the American who just humiliated their champion. During this fight, I've seen a lot of changing. The way you felt about me, and the way I felt about you. But if I can change, Я думаю, что каждый тоже изменился сегодня. And you can change. Вы можете измениться. Everybody can change. Каждый может измениться. This sucks because the entire Russian audience loves this speech. Their champion has just been defeated by an American, and yet everyone is willing to stand, listen, and cheer. What makes it even worse is that the Russian leaders applaud Rocky's speech. This was actually corrected in the 2021 director's cut, but in the theatrical version of the movie, it makes the speech and the movie's ending feel cartoonish. Ultimately, the problem here is that you have a rushed reaction. I can buy the idea of some listeners respecting Rocky's toughness and absorbing his message, but that that instant acceptance that we get here is just too much. And it makes the story's themes come off as silly while undermining any impact the speech might have had. For a good example, let's look at Tyrion's trial in Game of Thrones. I'm cheating a little here because Tyrion's speech gets interrupted again and again by Tywin, but we'll count it as a monologue. And if you remember, in season four, Tyrion is falsely accused of murdering King Joffrey, and almost everyone at the trial wants Tyrion to face punishment for it. Here are some highlights from the scene. I saved you. I saved this city and all your worthless lives. I should have let Stannis kill you all. Tyrion! Do you admit you poisoned the king? I'm guilty of a far more monstrous crime. I'm guilty of being a dwarf. I did not kill Joffrey, but I wish that I had. Watching your vicious bastard die gave me more relief than a thousand lying whores. I wish I was the monster you think I am. I will not give my life for Joffrey's murder, and I know I'll get no justice here. I demand a trial by combat. And this works because the audience in King's Landing is understandably outraged, horrified, and disgusted. The individual characters here also react appropriately. Jamie fears for Tyrion's life. Tywin frequently interrupts Tyrion. Cersei looks furious when he mentions the pleasure he took in Joffrey's death. And there's strong emotional purpose to this scene. Tyrion is tired of being mistreated his whole life and tired of taking blame. Finally, Tyrion uses the monologue to take control of the situation. At the end, he demands a trial by combat, and this prompts even more reactions from the major characters. Second type of bad monologue is the shoehorned monologue. This is when the situation doesn't call for a monologue, but the writers nonetheless force one in. It's a cheap excuse to verbalize a character's thoughts and emotions. It might spare the character from facing serious conflict or taking serious action. It can make the character look silly, stupid, or weak. And ultimately, it feels contrived and unnecessary. For a bad example, let's look at the 2020 movie of Valentine's Match. 
This is a Hallmark movie, so you know the drill here. Two attractive people meet, they date, they break up, they get back together at the end. This particular movie ends with a woman running through the airport so she can profess her love to a guy. Unfortunately for her, she can't get on the plane, and unfortunately for us, we get a monologue that nobody asked for. Here's the deal. I have to get to this guy. He was my first love. We almost got married. Then he thought that I wanted this big career, so he lied to me, which is a different story. But I didn't know who I was anymore. I was comparing myself to other people. I worked all the time. That's all I did was work, work, work. But it's true. And if I hadn't seen that yellow mug, that was what made me realize, why do I want a big career if I don't have anybody to share it with? Or at the expense of your heart and your soul. You know what I mean? And I love him so totally and so completely, and I have to tell him, but I can't tell him unless you open the door. I think you should turn around. This sucks because the monologue adds nothing to the story other than a cheap joke, and it robs the scene of potential drama and conflict. Instead of her coming up with a clever way to get on the plane, convenient timing saves the day. On top of that, she regurgitates the entire plot to a random airline worker, and in the process, she spells out the story's theme. She really hits it on the nose by saying how she's learned that love is more important than her career and all that other stuff. Now, for a good example, let's look at 10 Things I Hate About You. This movie is a modern retelling of Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew, and the basic plot follows two sisters, one who is desirable and one who isn't. Their weirdo father makes a rule that neither sister can start dating unless both do, and this prompts somebody in school to pay Heath Ledger to date the undesirable sister. Initially, he goes along with it to make money, but as we all know, Heath Ledger doesn't care about money, and before long, the two outcasts fall in love. Later on, the truth comes out, then there's a nasty breakup, and then the movie ends with a scene in English class where the girl decides to read a poem in front of her classmates. Lord, here we go. I hate the way you talk to me and the way you cut your hair. I hate the way you drive my car. I hate it when you stare. I hate the way you're always right. I hate it when you lie. I hate it when you make me laugh. Even worse, when you make me cry. I hate it when you're not around and the fact that you didn't call. <laughs> but mostly I hate the way I don't hate you. Not even close. Not even a little bit. Not even at all. This works because the speech serves a meaningful purpose. It allows a quiet, wounded girl to take action at the story's climax. And it's uncomfortable in a good way. Having her read a poem in front of her class allows for more tension than if she had simply confronted her boyfriend directly. The speech also sounds natural. The poem itself is believable and grounded in her teenage character. It comes straight from the heart and expresses her conflicted emotions. Finally, the classroom reaction is real. The kids sit in baffled silence, and the look on Heath Ledger's face is everything it needs to be. The third type of bad monologue is the uninspired rally cry. This is a pre-battle speech that falls flat. It includes generic words, cliched phrases, predictable emotions. And the speaker doesn't do enough to inspire confidence. And ultimately, the speech feels forced, and the audience reaction feels unearned. For a bad example, let's look at Snow White and the Huntsman. This movie came out in 2012, and it's a darker, grittier take on the Snow White fairy tale. Basically, there's this evil queen who drains beauty from young women, and Snow White is the only one who can stop her. Toward the end, Snow eats a poisoned apple, and after she wakes up, she decides to rally an army against the evil queen. All these years, all I've known is darkness. But I have never seen a brighter light than when my eyes just opened. Those embers must turn to flame. I will become your weapon. Forged by the fierce fire that I know is in your hearts! I can kill her. And I'd rather die today than live another day of this death! And who will ride with me? Who will be my brother? Okay, so I'm not gonna be her brother, and here's why. First of all, the language in the monologue is too abstract. She talks about iron and light and embers and fire and darkness and just overdoes it with the metaphors. She doesn't give enough concrete reasons to fight alongside her, doesn't appeal to what her listeners need. For instance, why not remind everyone that the evil queen has been preying upon their sisters, daughters, and neighbors? Another issue here is that the speech has this me, me, me quality to it. If you listen to it, she says, all I've ever known is darkness. I've never seen a brighter light. 
I will become your weapon. I can kill her. Who will ride with me? She focuses so much on herself and doesn't do enough to connect with the people she's trying to rally. And as a result, the army's reaction feels unearned. For a good example, let's look at Any Given Sunday. This is a movie about a struggling football team that's falling apart due to things like greed, egos, and jealousy. Al Pacino plays their washed up head coach, and right before they take the field for the biggest game of their season, he delivers this absolute banger of a speech. Three minutes to the biggest battle of our professional lives. Either we heal as a team, or we're gonna crumble. Inch by inch, play by play, till we're finished. We can fight our way back into the light. We can climb out of hell, one inch at a time. I made every wrong choice a middle-aged man can make. You find out life's this game of inches. So is football. The inches we need are everywhere around us. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. On this team, we fight for that inch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that itch. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you this, in any fight, it's the guy who's willing to die who's going to win that itch. Yeah. Now, I can't make you do it. You got to look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now, I think you're going to see a guy who will go that inch with you. And either we heal now as a team, or we will die as individuals. Now, what are you going to do? And this is amazing because of the powerful use of emotion, language, and metaphor. It's poetic while remaining grounded in football. He talks about inches in the game of football and relates it back to life itself. He also does a great job of building unity. He addresses the fact that they're in hell. He admits his own failings in order to get on their level. Then he solidifies the unit by saying, on this team we fight for that inch. He creates an emotional connection between all the players by saying things like, look at the guy next to you, look into his eyes. That's some powerful stuff. Another thing I want to point out is that this speech has circularity. This is the idea that the end connects back to the beginning. It's a good technique to use, and it opens and closes this particular speech with the idea of healing as a team versus dying as individuals. Finally, the speech ends with him empowering them to choose their future. He asks, what are you going to do? And that motivates them to create their own destiny. And then our fourth type of bad monologue is the bland backstory dump. This is when a character reveals important backstory in underwhelming fashion. It's a missed opportunity to bring the past to life, it fails to create tension, mystery, or intrigue, and it feels like an info dump rather than a meaningful speech. For a bad example, let's look at The Last Jedi. The monologue we're going to listen to comes during the second of Luke and Rey's training sessions. This is the one where they discuss the history of the Jedi before Luke admits how he failed to train Kylo Ren. My nephew, with that mighty Skywalker blood and in my hubris, I thought I could train him, I could pass on my strengths. I took him and a dozen students and began the training temple. By the time I realized I was no match for the darkness rising in him, it was too late. I went to confront him and he turned on me. When I came to, the temple was burning. He had vanished with a handful of my students and slaughtered the rest. Leia blamed Snoke, but it was me. I failed. This sucks because it feels like a Wikipedia summary. The language is dry, the content is predictable, and there's a lack of specific details. Nothing here lights your mind on fire or paints a picture of what happened, aside from obviously the flashback that they use. But the speech itself tells us nothing new. Going into this scene, we know that Luke failed Kylo Ren and that Kylo embraced the dark side. Then we come out of this scene knowing little else other than that Luke feels bad about what happened. Another issue is that the speech fails to create intrigue. There's actually 
actually more to the backstory here, and we do get that info about 20 minutes later, but this particular monologue doesn't raise any burning questions that make us want more information. For a good example, let's look at Game of Thrones again, specifically Jaime Lannister's monologue when he's in the bath with Brienne of Tarth. This comes in season three, and it's when Jamie explains how he came to be known as the Kingslayer. You heard of wildfire? Of course. The Mad King was obsessed with it. He loved to watch people burn. The their skin blackened and blistered and melted off their bones. Arrows were traitors everywhere. So he had his pyromancer place caches of wildfire all over the city. Finally, day of reckoning came, but my father arrived first. The whole Lannister army at his back, promising to defend the city against the rebels. We opened the gates and my father sacked the city. Once again I came to the king, begging him to surrender. He told me to bring him my father's head. Then he turned to his pyromancer. Burn them all, he said. Tell me if your precious Randy commanded you to kill your own father and stand by while thousands of men, women and children burned alive. Would you have done it? Would you have kept your oath then? First I killed the pyromancer and then when the king turned to flee, I drove my sword into his back. That's where that Stark found me. He judged me, killed you the moment he set eyes on me. This works because it paints a vivid picture of what happened from Jamie's perspective. There are plenty of specific details about the event and how he emotionally responded, and he does a great job setting things up by establishing what was at stake. He discusses the wildfire, the pyromancer, and the Mad King's plan to incinerate the city as well as its inhabitants. Then Jamie establishes the terrible dilemma he faced. He had to choose between his sworn duty and what he believed was right. Then he turns it back on Brienne and delivers that chilling line, would you have kept your oath then? This line is directed at Brienne, but it also hits the at-home audience. It gets us to sympathize with Jamie and understand his motivations. A few other things I want to point out. The speech does an amazing job at conveying his guilt, shame, and anguish. He's sick of being criticized for saving lives, and he hates that Ned Stark caught him at the wrong moment and let the world know. Then you have some strong poetic techniques and word choice, and the monologue fits the story's themes of power and identity. So I hope this helps. Question of the day, what is your favorite or least favorite monologue from a story? Let us know in the comments section below. Thank you for watching. If you want to support the channel, please pick up copies of any of my books. And once again, The Half Murders, I'll be releasing it at the end of the month. It's like Jekyll and Hyde meets The Haunting of Hill House. So if that sounds like something that's up your alley, check out the pre-order link in the description below. Also, be sure to check out my other videos, like, share, and subscribe. And as always, remember to keep on writing.